just recently they, they had the Chief Communication Officer Survey 4. So this was released. And one of the questions they asked, they asked CEOs, you know, what are some important skills people should have? And you can see rising each year up to 65% this year is crisis communication, which shows you how important this is becoming. They call it crisis management. But for me, the heart of crisis management is actually crisis communication. So I have to start thinking, why? Why are they playing, placing so much value on this? And we can look at it in the fact that crisis communication is a very important aspect of strategic communication to help us achieve some of the objectives that we have in a crisis situation. And we can take an illustration of that for reputation. That during a crisis, your reputation takes a hit, so it drops down. So we have what would be the projected, our reputation stays the same, crisis hits, we drop down. Well, the idea is with effective crisis communication, we start to rebound, we're gonna rebound quicker. Because we all know that in a crisis, time is our best friend. Over time, people forget. They come back, they buy products, they fly on our airplanes. But we also know ineffective crisis communication is going to make the situation worse. So you can't just get out there and say anything. And if you followed over the summer the train crash in Canada and how whenever their CEO talked, they made the situation worse, which essentially was the headline in Business Week publication, CEO speaks, things get worse. So he replaced Tony Hayward as the really bad CEO during a crisis. So the question then that, that drives my research and what I want to talk about today is how do we tell the difference between effective and ineffective crisis communication? Because there actually is a lot on the line, particularly as the crisis becomes more severe. So what I want to do today is talk a little bit about the connection between practice, theory, and research. Some walk you through the theory I have and been applying, and then end up talking about the lessons. What do we learn? What does all this research that's been conducted tell us about the practice? Because in the end, that's really the most important component. Because crisis communication is an applied type of communication. And from my perspective as an academic, applied research tries to solve real world problems. And it needs to feed back into that process. And we want to think of it graphically, this is what it would look like. You start off with and there's a practice, and practitioners are out there doing things. And this is how crisis management started to really come to the attention uh, of academics in, in the early 90s. Because they saw what was going on out there. They said, well, how do we make sense of all this? So you look at the practice, and you develop a theory to try and explain this, to guide it, to better understand why something works or doesn't work. Then you test your theory. And that's the boring part on the academic side when we sit around, run our tests, and we do our statistics, and we see what comes out. But then, it should be have an application that feeds back into the practice, and the cycle continues. And the goal is that we help to use our theory and our research to improve the practice. But I'd like to think of it in a much more simpler way, take away this, and it comes down to two words. And it comes down to the words of speculation versus fact. What would you rather have when you're there dealing with your crisis situation? Speculation, here's what some people did in the past and it seemed to work, or facts. This actually did work, and this is why it should work for you. And that's what we've been driving for in this research, to move from speculation into fact. It's, I like to, to liken it to medicine. If you were to go into your doctor, and your doctor says, well, you have hypertension, and I can give you two options. We could do bloodletting. We cut you open, bleed out about a pint. That should kind of reduce your blood pressure. Or I have this nice medicine that should work. Well, for hundreds of years, people went with bloodletting. And really, it's just been about the last hundred years, they've really gotten rid of bloodletting. That was all speculation. We want to know with fact. And the fact is what the pharmaceutical companies are giving us with the trials that they run. So this is where SCCT comes into play. I'm sorry about the name. It's just, it's kind of long and awkward, so that's why we abbreviate it. It's a theory-based approach, and what we're trying to do with this is to identify key relationships, key factors that are out there in a crisis, and then understand and be able to predict from that, see what should work, and again, what shouldn't work. Because I think it's also really important to understand what we shouldn't do in a crisis. What is it that just makes the situation worse for us? We always like to focus on, oh, these are what we should do, but a lot of companies do what they shouldn't do. And it's based upon attributions people make. That when there's a negative situation like a crisis, people speculate in their own minds. And this comes to us from psychologists, and people wonder, 
What caused this? Was this the organization itself? Or was it some external factor that caused it? And as an organization, you want to be that external factor. Because that results in a lot less what we call crisis responsibility. And with that, there's a lot of other damage. There's reputational damage and a number of other outcomes that I'll talk about as well. So it's, it comes down to that crisis responsibility there. And to really, how did that, as a crisis manager, when you're going into that situation, how can you predict what it's going to be? It, are you facing a really bad situation with heavy crisis responsibility or a lower situation? And that's where we've identified key situational factors that help guide people's reactions to it. So as a crisis manager, when the crisis hits, I look at key indicators, and then based upon that, I can take actions for it. So it's the idea of trying to, to read the situation. And in terms of communication, we're really looking at it in three types of responses here. And they, they roughly go in order, although during a crisis you might collapse and do them all at once. But it starts off with instructing information. And this is all about public safety. You have to tell people how to protect themselves physically from the crisis. I've put out a, a toaster that could catch fire and be problematic for you. I need to get that off the market, and I need to warn you about that. That's the type of instructing information. You have adjusting information, and that really deals with public welfare. And that's to help you cope psychologically with the situation. And we'll, we'll come back to that in just a moment here. And then you work on your reputation management. What, it, what do you say and do to try and rebuild the damage that's been done? In addition to the reputation management, it's also going to help you with some other outcomes that again, we'll review towards, towards the end here. Some crises do involve public safety, though. There's actually a physical risk to your stakeholders. It could be your customers, it could be your employees, it could be people in the community. Each year, I think any, about 40,000 people are evacuated because of chemical releases each year in the, in the U.S. So there's safety issues. And here's a couple ideas of public safety. We've got chocolate, salmonella and chocolate shouldn't be there. Makes people sick, that's bad. Cadbury learned that the hard way. They, they, they knowingly sold chocolate with salmonella in it because it was Easter. They thought better to take the profits and take their gamble with it. They eventually did recover. Special K had glass in their red berries. And then Bosch and Mom, because of the, the, the renews it, there was actually eye fungus was being spread as a result of that, a disease outbreak for them. Uh, in the case of both Cadbury and Bosch and Long, overall handled very poorly. Special K with red berries actually handled very well. They were able to get out in front of it. Then you have public welfare issues. People worry about things. You have the Dreamliner. People worry, I'm on a Dreamliner. Is the battery going to be OK? Then you have the Carnival Triumph. People are out on a Carnival Cruise. They're hoping, that's not me, that I don't get stranded out at sea with, no, with very little food and no bathrooms. And then when Tyco had the corruption, people worried, will their new management come in? Will it, be, will it be right? Will they be good? Will they be able to turn this company around? This is public welfare, and this is, this is the psychological side of it that you have to deal with. And you combine these in what we've termed the ethical-based response. And anytime you're facing a crisis where there are victims, you're going you're gonna to engage in this ethical-based response. You're going to provide instructing information. With your adjusting information, you're going to talk about corrective action. How are you, what are you doing to fix the problem? So if you can't say you're going to fix the problem, people are still going to worry about it. You know, Boeing's still wrestling with that. Then you have sympathy. You need to express sympathy for the people involved. And some companies actually skip over this. They, they forget about the, the victim side of it. It was one of the major problems that we saw with the situation with BP is they, they, they forgot about the victim side and talked too much about the financial bottom line of, of BP, which people didn't care about at the time. Now, when you want to then move on to reputation management, you're going to need to choose from your strategies. We're going to talk about uh, those strategies here. And what you do is you assess the threat level. And the threat level is actually how do I determine how people are going to perceive my responsibility for that crisis? Are they going to see me as responsible or me as not so responsible, or in some cases, seeing my organization as a victim of the crisis that emerges. And so what you do is you first look at the crisis types, we're going to talk about those, and then a little bit about the intensifiers, what increases people's perception that you're actually responsible for the crisis. If we look at the crisis types, we found that they break down along this continuum. And for the most part, you're going to either be in a, in a victim or an intentional. Uh, accidental is there, not that many crises actually fall into that category, though, that, that are pure accidental. On the victim side, 
you have product tampering. You have terrorist attacks. You have cases where there's actually threats against you. Uh, Red Bull was under a situation where they were trying to be extorted. Someone was, was raising that issue for them. You also have hacking. People hack into your systems and create problems for you. It happens to large-scale financial institutions. It happens to retail institutions. It happens to, most recently, a company called Buffer. And what Buffer does is they have software that helps you manage your social media. Well, well they were hacked. So you're, you're a victim of that. There's very low responsibility. People understand that. And that these are the easier crises to manage. When you go on the other end, it's an intentional <coughs> BP at Texas City was a result of management having a terrible safety culture. They encouraged bad practices, and that's what led to the explosion that, that killed all the people there at that facility. That's intentional. You knowingly put people at risk. Bad safety culture. You knowingly send out the product. That was, Cadbury was caught. They, they were known. Uh, do you remember in 2009, the huge peanut paste recall and all the thousands of yeah. products that did? That was intentional. They knew it. What did, the, what did the evidence show? They repeatedly were getting tests that was positive for a foodborne illness. Then they finally did get one negative test. And when they got the one negative test, the email from the CEO would essentially, we'll ship it now. You know, and we'll send the one negative test to the government. The three positive tests, legally, we don't have to tell them about it. Well, there's legal and there's moral issues. That's intentional. That's the worst case scenario because now they know they're going to blame you, they're going to come after you. Bosch and Long ran into the same situation. They refused, they weren't going to recall their product. They had an, what, um, it's hard, hard to explain. It's not an involuntary recall. What happened was the people who distributed it and sold it refused to sell it anymore. You had CVS, you have, you have Walgreens say, we're not going to sell your product. So they ended, that helped to create the fun of the recall. They, they were. Uh, and that was an extreme case of, of denial. We'll, we'll come to that in a minute. Then your intensifiers, your crisis history, and your prior reputation. And what, what the data clearly shows is what we call a Velcro effect. That if you had a history of past crises, they're going to lay more responsibility on top of you because it's a pattern of behavior for you. Same way, they didn't like you before the crisis. More reason not to like you now because of your crisis, so it's going to intensify the damage. So even if you're in an accidental situation where there's sort of minimal responsibility, it's going to shift it up to the level of extreme responsibility. And if you had been in the victim section, let's say, for instance, you've experienced multiple hacking incidents, you no longer get that benefit of being attacked because they're wondering, what is it about your system that's allowing all this hacking to get in? So it can progressively get worse for you as you have more crises. And we find this real, there's a belief in a halo effect that your, your, your positive reputation protects you from all damage. It doesn't. You're still going to take some damage, but you're in, you still come out in better shape towards the end with it. And these are then your response strategies to choose from. What are you going to do? You're going to, you go from denial to rebuild. So you go from saying there's no crisis whatsoever to saying, yes, we're responsible, we're going to work, we're going to help you. And then off to the side, there's bolstering. Bolstering is where you thank the people who've helped you. Toyota did that to their customers who stood by them during the situation, their recalls. So you thank them. It's sort of a secondary strategy that you use. Uh, diminish, <coughs> rarely used, actually. So you, you tend to break it down. You're either going to deny or you're going to rebuild. Uh, sometimes you do need to deny. If you're in a rumor situation, you need to deny. Go back to the peanut paste recall. If you were to go to the website of any of the three major peanut butter manufacturers during that time period, the first thing you would encounter was a statement of denial, saying, our peanut butter has not been recalled. The reason being, Harvard did a study. They did a survey about people's awareness of the, of the recall. And one of the things they asked people is, is peanut butter being recalled? 75% of the people surveyed thought peanut butter was being recalled when it wasn't. And that's some pretty strong data. Yeah, let's, so that's why any website of the three major peanut butter manufacturers you went to started with denial. So sometimes you need denial, but going to come back. Be very careful what you do with denial. That's that's a, a dangerous strategy for some companies to play with. And rebuild is when you engage in apology or compensation that you do there, and, and those are very different. I can compensate people but not accept responsibility. When you apologize, you're accepting responsibility and all the legal liabilities that go with that as well. Because that will be used against you in a court of law. Expressions of sympathy, 
Uh, technically, in many, most states, not. So what we have is a matching situation. That as the threat increases, I need to become ever more accommodated. So my, my costs are going to escalate. But it's, that's the price you pay. Uh, you've been bad. You've been caught in a, a situation. You need to work your way out of it. Uh, Cadbury did. Cadbury is a case where Cadbury, for a string of six, seven years, was by reputation the top chocolate brand in the UK. The year they had the outbreak, they dropped from number one. The next year, they returned to it. Because they, they went back. They apologized for what they did. They explained what happened and why they were sorry about it. And they, they weren't ever going to let that happen again. And they, they got into a little bit of a dispute with the government in the UK because one of their early statements said that they had an acceptable level of salmonella in their chocolate, to which the government replied, the acceptable level of salmonella in chocolate is zero. There is no marginal acceptable level for it. So why does this work? Well, it comes back to trust. So what we're using when we look at reputation is actually a measurement of trust. It's based on trustworthiness that, that we're looking at. Because that's a, that's a common element that's used across most of the measures of reputation that are out there. It's trust. And that's what's going to help you rebuild your reputation, is to rebuild trust. And as perceptions of crisis responsibility escalate, I need to be ever more accommodating to it. But along with reputation, there are other things that come out of there. When you start looking at the outcomes that are there, we can start also talking about the emotions that crises generate, because they do. And you see this online in the comments that people make. The emotion is there. Anger and anxiety are two important ones. And I, I want to look at those in, in a minute, too. You also want to alter the media coverage. Because historically, you look back when we first start talking about crisis communication. It's about the media. It's about the news media saying bad things about us, relaying things about our crisis. It's, it's damaging to an organization. So what do we do with that? Then long term, we can talk about the idea of quicker reputation recovery. You can lessen the effect on the damage to purchase intention, which is a, is a great asset to have. You can lessen the likelihood of negative word of mouth occurring, which is good too, particularly in today's internet situation, that I might post a negative message a month later, I'm okay with it, but if my post remains and someone searches information about the company, they run across it. These, these records last. Yeah. Look at, uh, uh, at Procter & Gamble and the Febreze. This has been probably close to a decade now since they had their problem with denying that rumor. You search for Febreze on the internet, you can still run across emails about that and uh, pick up that negative information. There's also been some, some evidence linking it to share price as well. And I just want to pull out a couple of these to talk a little bit more about. And one of them is media coverage, and because this is an interesting idea. You can break down media coverage. You know, you can have really a lot of negative media coverage. Ideally, as a company, you want high positive coverage for you. And when your crisis is really bad, you're in, you're in all the newspapers, you're in television, you're all over social media and the digital world. This is where you're at in a crisis. You're high, you want to move off of that situation. And ideally, in most cases, you're trying to move it down to a, a low negative effect. That's, that's probably the goal. You're going to move it down. There's not as much coverage, but it's probably still going to be negative about you. And that's where we find apology works. With an apology, the amount of coverage drops, but it stays negative because you've just admitted you're responsible for it. But you're less of a story because you have admitted you're responsible for it instead of people still speculating about it. And that's where a lot of the value of apology lies these days. Apology is, is more of, it's not so much as an asset, as a liability if you don't use it. It's, it's getting strange it, and how that's turned out. Many crises you start, you're just kind of low negative. Your crisis isn't too bad. And I want, I want to use Buffer as an example of that. So Buffer comes in, and they start working very hard to fix the situation. Buffer starts turning around. The messaging starts shifting over. It's a low amount of coverage, but it's very positive. People are talking about Buffer and how great Buffer was and what they did. And aren't they a great company? And it actually started to pick up some steam. It was moving towards the almost the idea of a high positive as they start, start praising them and saying, oh, this, this is great. And their customers who had been hacked and had their social accounts spammed are saying nice things about them, which is, is kind of rare. Uh, that's the extreme exception to the rule that you're in and then turn it around and get high positive. But occasionally you can move from low negative to low positive. But again, that's probably a very narrow band. You need to know about. Yeah? 
Can I ask you a question in terms of the timing of the apology? Uh, yeah. Using <laughs> Obamacare as a great example. Yes. Uh, it, it seems that it's followed that trajectory, but you know, how do you judge if the apology came too late or it was too early? Yeah, you're, you're probably more in a situation where it's going to be too late and that you're not going to get the same type of, of impact off of it because people are going to say, well, you were sort of forced into it, you didn't have any choice, and, and it seems less sincere to be going. And you'll see that, that type of commentary when it comes out really late. So that, that's when it hurts you, is, is the lateness. And uh, um, I'm glad you raised that point because I want to come back to timing here, here towards the end. Because you can, you can miss your window to when you can get the maximum effect out of it. And that's what the apology needs. You think that happens quite a bit in politics. Politicians get pushed, and then they finally, you know, Clinton, a lot of them, there's a, there's a long legacy of politicians waiting for it. Uh, corporations, to their credit, usually move quicker than that. I think they see the relevance more. I was wanted to highlight a few things about emotion because this is a fascinating part of it, and it's it's the completely oftentimes irrational part that you're dealing with in a crisis. And one of them is the idea of anger and negative word of mouth. Anger generates negative word of mouth. Crisis communication can help to mitigate anger. So if I can mitigate anger, I'm going to lessen the likelihood you're going to go out there and you're going to post negative things about me because you're mad and you're ready to post, but I get in there quick, you know. Uh, and you're happy and you don't post the negative things about them. If you look at hacking, if you compare how this situation was, was handled to when the Xbox accounts were hacked a few years ago, and there was a delay of about four days be before they told the account holders that they had been hacked and perhaps their personal financial data had been compromised, oh, there was a lot of anger and a lot of posts coming off of that. And you'd go to their website, I think they had like 3,000 posts in one day, and they were not happy people about that. And it was very negative word of mouth for that. Buffer didn't have that, because they were able to knock back the anger by acting quickly. Because people want revenge in this situation. They're mad, and the negative word of mouth is revenge. That, I mean, it, that is what it's about. Because you, you can start, you can, you can measure revenge on scales, and that's what they want. I'm going to get back at you. I'm going to say bad things about you publicly. There's also anxiety. Anxiety is my fear. Can I really trust it? Again, you know, I talked about the Dreamliner, but it happened with, with products too. Did you did you really fix that? So I, I feel like I can use your product again. So that has an anxiety has an impact on purchase intention. And it, again, our communication can address that very effectively if we do it if we do it right. If we do it ineffectively, you don't. Know, talk too much, it probably will end as a brand and sometimes as a company. The Peanut Corporation of America went out of existence because of how badly they, they created and they handled the situation. Uh, some organizations just don't know how to communicate in crises, even though this seems very logical and very common sense, which I tell my students, and then you know the next day, one will say, I just saw where this company did X. Like, yeah, we did that. I remember there was a a situation in Boston where a company was doing a promotional campaign for a very small movie. And they put up what to um, some people look like a bomb. They were wired up, they were, there were wires sticking in, there were lights showing. They evacuated the city. It cost the, the city about a million dollars, which eventually the, the parent company paid for. The company that was at the center of the crisis putting these messages out wouldn't say anything. They were waiting, they waited over 24 hours. They told the two men who were caught distributing the messages, they were to say nothing for 48 hours as they were being held in jail. That, that doesn't work. That, that, that's, that's not how you go about doing it. Which brings me to, to some of the crisis communication traps. We've talked a little bit about what does work. I'm in a bad situation, I can enter into what I might do here. <coughs> Apologies, sometimes people think that's just a default. All right, I'm in, a, I'm in a crisis, I'm going to apologize, it's going to make the world a better place. No, that's not always the case. Sometimes you make it worse. Sometimes we've found that with apologies, if it's, if it's a really minor situation and you go overboard with an apology, people think you're hiding something. But it must be a lot worse than that. You can have overkill. We've seen research, and, and this is mostly coming out of the psych psychology side, is that if, I, if I'm not sure, let's say I've had an accident and I'm not sure the cause of it, if I apologize as a corporation and later I'm not responsible, that actually comes back to hurt you. And again, that, that's counterintuitive. That, oh, people should be happy. I apologize. Why are they mad? Well, it gets back, you must be incompetent. You didn't know why, you didn't know why that occurred. 
And we find also similar strategies, compensation and sympathy typically work as good as an apology. 